Anyway, I do want to welcome you back. By, by a round of applause, how fabulous has the morning been? I'm glad to hear that. You know, at lunch it was great to walk around and listen to many of you just excited about things you want to do and things you want to incorporate and questions about yourself and want to find out more and the library is going to be a busy place or the online library is going to be a busy place because people wanted to know more and want to get textbooks and all the rest of that. I think there will be some increases in enrollment in some of the classes uh, regarding some of the professors who spoke this morning. But we are here for the next hour or so to engage some of the senior leaders of the college to talk about ways that they may be foster community within their departments or throughout the college or on a campus. And so there are a few questions. As all of you who've been on these panels, you know, more or less questions are given to you so that there's a little bit you can frame your thoughts around. Let me just give you an overview of a couple of the questions that they were asked to think about. Because what I'd like to do is maybe after a question or two, ask you if you have a question of them. Because we've all sat in these where we listen to people go on and on and on for about an hour. And then there's five minutes left to ask a question. So let's see if we can't sprinkle questions in among the, the answers that they're going to give you. The seven that they have here very quickly are, you know, talk about some ahas from today. What ahas did you have about today? The other is, what, what ways do, does the college successfully foster community? The third is, why is fostering a sense of community critical to the success of their department? Fourth, provide an example of a best practice in regards to fostering community. Fifth, what two resources helped you in fostering a sense of community? Six, what one activity can hack students and employees do off campus to promote community and collaboration? And then the final one, is there anything else you'd like to add regarding fostering community that was not asked? So it gives you an idea of a couple of the questions and we may or may not get through all of them. I have about 14 others I'd like to ask uh, that uh, we may, depending on time. But let's start with, with the last one. As far as there anything else that you'd like to add regarding fostering community within the college that wasn't covered by the questions that you reflected on be before today and from this morning, try and make it real, real, as far as from what you sat through this morning at lunch talking to your colleagues. And uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you start with this idea of is there anything else you'd like to add? Now you will notice that someone was very OCD here today. And we, we start with A for ampersand, we go to Paul, we go to Carter, we go to Doherty, Messner, and Santa. So why don't we start with S in Tim Sando. <laughs> Could you, yeah. could you please ask the question again and have the national origin of the word, please? <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add regarding fostering community within the college that wasn't covered by these questions? So, you know, the only thing um, from my perspective that the largest thing from today that I reflect on from this morning, as I get older, I dream less. I don't know about you, but you get caught in your day-to-day -day operations and you think about the fires that are in front of you in the day. But when I was a young kid, I would dream. I would think about things to, to make the environment better, whatever that environment was. Today reminded me of we need to dream more. And I really picked that out of the Gettysburg session this morning. And for me, I know that's not exactly answering your question, but it stands out to the oldest pan panel member here today that I don't get to dream enough. And the, the art of dreaming is what will create change. And we'll, we all need to be agents of change as we face the challenges that are touching higher ed and touching uh, our college. So I'll just leave it at 
Please dream more. Thank you. And Tim, correction, you're the oldest gentleman on the stage. So <laughs> <laughs> oh. You knew that was coming. <laughs> So, so I'd like to kind of piggyback on what Tim said about change a little bit and, and kind of tie it back into IT for a minute. So when you think about technology and how often it changes, I think of it kind of uh, as trying to change a tire on a moving car. So today as I listen through everything that, that um, we, we talked about for fostering collaboration and, sorry, uh, about collaboration, what, what I heard and what resonated with me most is, how do I continue to bring my team together? How do we continue to work as a group when we're spread across all the campuses, as we currently are today? And how do we produce the best quality services? So um, for me, the biggest, the biggest takeaway that I have and the, the thing that I, I may not have quite put together until this point in time is, what else can we do together as a team to ingrain ourselves more in the college community? Thank you. So what, what I came away with is after both of the sessions that I attended, and especially the fabulous one on global ed, <laughs> we need time to process some of that. Jennifer had to switch out of her slide that talked about cultural dimensions and compared it with Americans versus our top international student population right here at Hack. And their cultural values are not the same as ours. So how does that, what does that mean when we interact with students on our campus, in our offices, in our classrooms? How do we take that into account? How does that alter our behavior? How do we become more welcoming and that left me with one question, I know, after 50, that <laughs> how do we get time to work through this? So today is a wonderful day, but what I don't like after this is we come away with thoughts, ideas, the, the germ, the start of something. And so what I would like to do, and I'm, I'm asking anyone who wants to jump in here to figure out how do we carve out time to continue this discussion about how do we make our campuses, our classes, more welcoming, more inclusive, more so we can focus on teaching and learning rather than worrying about if I feel safe here. So that's my question to follow the questions. Thank you, Cindy. And Jill and Jennifer, congratulations on your session this morning. Uh, Cindy told Warren and I that our session was the best that she attended. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> How many of you have family reunions? Yes, so you go to these family reunions and you meet some relatives for the first time. You see your favorite auntie, your favorite uncle, your favorite first cousin, and it's just there's nothing like family. And, and you then say, we need to see more of each other. So I felt that today. Um, this was like a reunion for us for all five campuses. So what I thought about is there are some of you who I really connect with. I don't see you enough. So I'm going to make a more concerted effort to see you more often so that I won't have to see you only at the family reunion. I'm going to encourage my team to do the same thing. So for me, building a sense of community, I want to see more of you outside of these types of venues. And by the way, this was wonderful. This was so good. But I want to see more of you because it feeds my soul. Mm. So if the question was what wasn't covered today, there was a lot of things covered today, but one thing that, that comes to mind when we speak about community, that's having a voice. Everyone within this community has a voice. And, and I know that might have been in some other presentations that I wasn't able to attend, and I know we've talked about it in past symposiums. But to have a community, everybody has to have a voice. And I encourage employees all the time, speak your mind, tell us your opinion, because that not only get something out that might be on your mind, but it encourages another person to listen. And you heard this morning that listening creates community. So I encourage you all to use your voice. Fantastic. Well, I have to say, as the youngest uh, person on the stage, <laughs> uh, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I took one big um, aha moment away from this morning, and that was the idea of the need to build bridges 
and really to continue to pursue strategic partnerships in the community. Uh, as I look at uh, you know, our environment and what's changing with enrollment trends and uh, demographic changes, you know, we're going to have to be very creative and think very differently about how we do this meaningful work as we move forward. And uh, one of the things that I've been encouraged by, really, since I've been here at HAC, but today I think was uh, really the, the tip of that spear, is to look around rooms like this and some of the other breakout rooms that we had and to realize that we have some of the best and brightest minds around right here. And so that absolutely true, absolutely true. And so it, it, it gives me great confidence to know that we've got the people here at the college to solve some of the great issues of our day. And I'm, I'm just excited to be able to be shoulder to shoulder with all of you and certainly with my peers to see that happen. So this has been a, a really transformative day for me. I'm grateful. Thank you, Steve. So for the group, what about you? Any aha? Uh -huh. And any question related to anything that they have said thus far? Any aha? Uh -huh. We have Melanie who's walking around with the microphone. Any aha? Uh -huh. Do we have any? We've got one here. Marie. For our community. Oh. I'll start again. I have a question relating to like the overall community. Since this is a two-year college, uh, a lot of students, including me, will eventually have to transfer to a four-year university. How do you keep, whether it's academically, socially, whatever it is, how do you think is the best way to keep a strong hack community even after a person leaves and becomes involved in another community? Oh, that's really mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? I know that you're a student. Mm -hmm. We're proud of you. Would you mind introducing yourself and telling us just a little about you? Oh. You're trying to build community. Yes. Um, <laughs> my name is Gracie Strasser. I'm the finance chair for the VLSAC, which is Hacks Virtual oh. Student Government. Oh, Can my I major is accounting. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to answer that question for you. My team and I are fortunate to work with our alumni. We have 95,000 alumni, most of whom live um, in central PA. And they are becoming increasingly active, so there are lots of things you can do. So just um, a few weeks ago, at our Lancaster campus, there was a student and alumni networking dinner, and our students and alumni came together and created magic. These students are learning from our alumni, the alumni are learning from the students, and the, not only did they have a good time um, getting career advice, but those relationships were, will extend beyond that one event. Also, um, members of, several members of the cabinet were invited to attend a college preparation workshop in January, and these were predominantly African American and Hispanic, and of course some white students as well, and they wanted to hear from alumni, so we had, for example, Stephen Ampersand was there, and Dr. Anderson, and others, but we had some of our alumni, and they were quite a hit, and they were talking about their experience at HAC, but beyond, and all of these alumni were successful, because we want to remind our students and alumni that we have some superstars who go on to do great things as alumni, and you should be proud of your affiliation with HAC. Um, we have an alumni committee of the foundation, and we would love to have you to be a part of that. And they <laughs> do things like sp plan special events. They raise monies for our students and our faculty and staff. So there are many opportunities. We have alumni to serve as guest speakers in our classrooms for our faculty. We have a whole laundry list of things that you can do <laughs> beyond your student experience here at HAC. So if you're interested, Christina, um, this young lady right in front of you, she can help you. Raise your hand, Christina. She literally is our development officer for alumni relations here at HAC, and she does all things alumni. So she can be a point of contact for you. You're welcome. One other question. <laughs> if you don't mind introducing yourself in the discipline you're in, please.
building effective, there I am, community <laughs> partnerships, and something, Tim, that you said about dreaming, was a buffer where failure is not punished. And so I also serve on the employee engagement team here, and I think about innovation, and with innovation, innovation doesn't occur without failures preceding it. And so I think for me, in the classroom, teaching biology, you might think, you know, how can I promote this concept? Because a lot of students are afraid of, of knowing all this factual information. But I actually try to help, I teach my students not just the successes of the great minds in science, but I actually highlight their failures. So I try to create an atmosphere where my students realize that to be a mover and a shaker, they, they cannot be afraid of failing. And I want us to be an institution where as employees, we also are not afraid of failing if we're seeking to be innovative. And Jennifer, how do you propose we do that? Oh, I thought I was asking a question. So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this was like a hopeful statement. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's really important that when we have creative ideas that are student focused and centered, and I think that's really important. I might have a great idea that benefits me, but I'm thinking more about ideas that benefit broader communities that benefit really our students and we really need to be student focused with our innovative ideas that we can seek our administrators present our ideas with confidence that you know through conversation if it's a valid idea that is deemed to be yeah let's try it that we're going to be supported and that if it flops we will not have the fear of any type of reprimand or or repercussion and i think in terms of trying to get greater employee engagement, release from that because we just applauded. I, I, we have phenomenal people here uh, at all of our campuses and virtual included in that that have phenomenal, phenomenal ideas and creative solutions to difficult problems. And I'd like to just see more of those people feel comfortable coming up front with those ideas with support to try something support to try it. You know, hey, let me give you a couple months, try it out, see what works. I mean, that's, I do course evaluations every semester. That's the point of my course evaluations. I can find out what flopped and I won't repeat it and what worked. And so I think um, we just need to create an atmosphere, a community atmosphere of support for that type of innovation, but you don't get it. And this is what Miles said, you don't get it without failing along the way. So we just have to have a little bit more of a buffer zone for that. And Jennifer, do you believe, one person, do you believe we're on the right track? Do you believe we're on our way to creating that kind of environment? From what I've seen, I'm in my third year tenure track faculty here. So from what I've seen, absolutely. And a lot of that comes from my participation on uh, some teams with Cavill and with Amy and seeing what you as leaders are trying to bring about here, it makes me really excited to be part of it. Thank you. And I'm not just saying that to <laughs> get kudos, <laughs> but, but it really does make me excited to be a part of it. Thank you. If she was asking a question, I'd like to address it if I can. Okay. So I'd like to give you two examples of things we're gonna try next year and we're gonna see if they work. Faculty came and said, we wanna try this. And the, um, I, I don't know if the reading is out of the bag yet. Is anybody here from reading? I would say it is now. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, they looked at the new AccuPlacer, they proposed cut scores, they proposed getting rid of English 01, and don't worry, they'll come to the deans in two weeks. And, and, but they said they want to assess, is it going to work or not? But we think this is a good idea. And they presented their foundation, their research, their proposal. It was well supported, well done. And I said, let's give it a go. And they said, but if it doesn't work, we want to be able to change it. And I said, well, so do I. So, <laughs> so that's a kind of cool partnership and innovation. It's actually parallel to what math is going forward. They tried that 281 course, which is a... Um, instructor-led but individualized instruction in a computer environment to, to try and summarize. And it worked well for this year, so we're going to make it into a full-fledged course for next year. We've tweaked it a little bit, and we're moving forward. Again, assessing, 
and using the successes to build on successes to keep going forward. So I, I hope that we are creating that kind of academic environment where we can try stuff. If it doesn't work, we'll all say it, it was a good try and we'll try something else then. Thank you. Any other area that would like to respond to that? Yeah, I would. Uh, so we talked a little bit and you've seen through some budgetary narrative that comes out that our budget's a challenge next year and the next year after that. And we're not unique. Hack is not unique. It's higher ed in general. Business models will be forced to change uh, or they're not going to survive. That understanding has to create a tolerance for ideas. They have to be logical, thoughtful, uh, and they need to be vetted but we will have very open minds. And, and I'm going to suggest, I spent 34 years in, in corporate America. I'm going to suggest we have a very safe place here to try things. And a leadership team that invites creativity and entrepreneurial thought processes. So I'm happy to be part of that. And I think you should all feel very good. Uh, that for us to make the changes necessary for the college long-term sustainability-wise, we're going to have to try new things, and we have to all be open to that. Absolutely. I'll take a step back. So uh, one of the things that I learned early when I came to the Student Affairs Unit was that um, we were seeing changes with our one-stops. And so we've heard of the one-stops, right, many of us? Um, you know, the idea was for students to come or prospective students to come and do everything they needed to do in one fell swoop uh, to help move them through as a call to action. Uh, years ago when we had application fees, we saw a little bit more of a return on that event because folks would come and we'd tell you, you show up and we'll waive your application fee. Well, with that carrot no longer there, we started to see uh, kind of a trailing off of participation and ultimately of the effectiveness of that. So one of the things that uh, was brought forward was this idea of, of doing uh, hack experience days. And the concept was let's, instead of uh, you know, a one stop where we bring everybody in and try to do start to finish placement testing you know, and then get them registered and all that kind of stuff, what, what if we uh, crafted an, an event that would allow students to come onto the campus and experience what it's like to be a hack student, what it's like to be a student in this discipline, that discipline, have folks who are passionate about these areas to be there and to speak and demonstrate for uh, prospects what it would look like. And so we piloted this at our Lancaster campus and it was wildly successful. And thanks to the foundation, we were able to leverage resources to make that possible to replicate at the other campuses as well. And so, um, you know, there was some risk with that. In enrollment management, you want to have a reliable call to action so you can kind of predict uh, where things are going to go. Um, and, and so we took a bit of a risk there. But again, things are changing. The environment is changing and we have to do things differently. And so I, I'm proud of the team. I'm proud of Natalie and, and her leadership to help pull that together with the admissions counselors. And really now we see people are engaged. They're coming. They want to hear. They want to learn more. Numbers are, have improved as a result of that. So we're going to look to do more things that are creative and outside of the box. Uh, but it does start, and I appreciate your point, it does start with uh, an openness and a receptiveness to new ideas. I can tell you I'm wide open because <laughs> we have some real barriers in front of us, as, as we know, and um, we're going to have to think differently about it. So I invite all of your ideas. We may not be able to do them all, but if we can do, as Jonathan said earlier, and come to consensus about what may work best for us, I think we'll be stronger for it in the long run. And you know, interesting one very quick example. We had a faculty member who emailed me yesterday after she talked to an individual at Boscov's, and I think all of you who shop at Boscov's, I know you're very sad, but they're going out of business. And this is one she was dealing with. Bontan. Bontan. Okay. I love Boscov's. Oh, I'm like, man, this is, we, we got to wrap this up. Boscov's is closed. We're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, their stock price just plummeted. <laughs>
knows that she's going to lose her job, but she wanted to know about other skills. So when she emailed me, I then emailed Vic Rogers and a few other individuals. And Vic is not here because he's meeting with the career stuff, the career link. He's meeting with the Workforce Investment Board today because they're trying to figure out what can they do to come together to talk to the people at, at the department store to see what we might be able to do in regards to getting them more engaged. So thank you for the idea that is coming to us. So that's great. Anyone else want to answer yeah. okay. the question? Yes, I'd like to kind of talk about an initiative that we have in IT for electronic forms with workflows. Mm -hmm. uh, what was brought to our attention was that, you know, the college is many forms. Some of them are electronic. Uh, the ability to fill them out, not so much. The ability to sign them, not so much. One of the things that came to our attention was how could we take and improve those processes? So if you think about, um, you know, creating a sense of uh, collaboration, how can we give you a collaborative tool to help you in your um, divisions and in the campuses? So we're, we're taking what I consider to be a, a calculated risk, and it could be an easy a risk of failure in the, in the end. And uh, we're, we've picked a solution that is very easy to use, very inexpensive. It allows you to get the quick and dirty done, the forms that are out there, get them converted, and try it. And let's see how those forms and workflows can go. Uh, once we assess the, the uh, utilization of it, the effectiveness of it, we can determine whether um, this is something that we would want to invest the, the significant amount of dollars it would take to put in a full-fledged enterprise, uh, or they could just remain at the level that they are, and we see that there's a lot of lessons learned from there. So I think, I think each of us at, on the panel, we, we do try to take those initiatives knowing that there's, there's always a high risk of failure, but from failure, we have lots of lessons learned. I look forward to seeing this one. Thanks for asking the question, Jennifer. Any final question before we move on to the next question? Okay, let's go to number three. It's a three-part <laughs> question. Don't you feel like you're going to be in an interview? Yeah, question for four parts. So, the first is, why is fostering a sense of community critical to the success of your team? The second part of that is, what challenges have you had to overcome to foster the success? And third, what two ways did you and your team overcome these challenges? So why is fostering a sense of community important and critical to your team? What challenges did you have to overcome? And what two ways did you and your team overcome those challenges? Ski, Open to anyone. Ski, I'll take a stab at it. So how many in here have uh, done the disk analysis so our team is the finance team. So about, <laughs> <laughs> is there one person who clapped? <laughs> <I see. laughs> Good job, Kathy. And Rich. Hey, Rich. I didn't see Rich, I'm sorry. <laughs> so think about which letter finance people are. We, Seventy percent of us are C's. So we're really good at and comfortable in front of an Excel spreadsheet and analyzing and look at all the ways it can work and it can't work. Uh, we're comfortable behind a desk. We're comfortable behind a closed door. And when you add all of that with the word community, it doesn't go together very well. So part of the challenges we have in the Office of Finance is to break down some of those barriers. So when I think about the things that we've done in the last couple years to try to do that, is we need to get outside of our office, outside of behind our desk, uh, and go out into the market. So in the last two years, our budget process has required our team to go out to the campuses, sit down and talk to the different groups about what the budget looks like, you know, what things can we do to improve it. Uh, so there's far more outreach. We've done, uh, I know this sounds not, not revolutionary, but for us it was, more one-on-ones. Most of our, I would call internal meetings would be a management meeting across the board, uh, but didn't have enough opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one to people 
without taking away the barriers and the, the risks of saying something. Uh, so for us, that trying to marry a bunch of C's in a community setting has been uh, a worthwhile challenge because I think there's been some growth, but it has taken some time. It's going to continue to be a journey. So I'm not sure if I got one, two, or three of those answered, Ski. None. None. <laughs> that really wasn't one of the options I provided. Right. <laughs> so so if, I can, if I can jump in, you know, if you think about IT, it's across all the campuses. And my teams have really two sets of responsibilities. They have the set of responsibilities to the entire division and college as a whole plus to the campus that they're related or they're serving and they're located on. So my challenge in fostering a sense of community was how do I bring that team together under one vision and one common path forward? So one of the things that we put in place was we brought them all together for a retreat. And it was an interesting gathering of individuals because you have a group, they're not what you'd consider to be extroverts, they're introverts, and when you have an IT retreat, you really need to get them involved. So um, we, we have uh, challenging exercises to try to get everyone to come together as a team and start to, to talk about what are the challenges we're facing, where are the commonalities, how do we together resolve them, and how do we move the college forward as, as one college. Um, the second thing that we did put in place is after we, we met at the retreat and we identified these things, we had to put together a strategic plan. So I'm happy to say we have a technology strategic plan from 2018 to 2020 with four goals that we're going to work diligently to meet. Uh, highlighting just one of those goals would be cybersecurity. And many of you may have uh, received emails just today in your inboxes about our cybersecurity awareness program. So that is an outcome from us putting this together. So. Um, I think I've answered questions one, two, and three. You did very well. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Finance, IT. Seize. So I'd like to jump in from a different perspective. Why is community important in academic affairs? Because we are offering consistent quality courses and programs at five different campuses, an hour apart each plus a rigorous online series of offerings. So how do you make sure it's uh, consistent across with those challenges? On top of that, you may not know, we actually have a unique structure, organizational structure in academic affairs uh, that is unlike any other institution of higher education that I can determine where, um, not to bore you with words like matrix model, but <laughs> to tell you that when we were restructured, the academic dean's role was split in half, half given to the campus dean for operations, half given to the department chair for curriculum. So what does that do? That forces the collaboration, and that's actually the key to how we're able to offer consistency throughout this range of uh, offerings. And one example of how we've done that, to get to question number three, the is uh, through the faculty evaluation process. That's actually been a work in process. In fact, the whole academic affairs organization where it started out, we actually had an exercise two years running before I got on the job that was called, Who Signs My Form? <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we developed a spreadsheet of here's what Dean signed, and then we distributed that to faculty so they can answer. They were actually asking legitimately. I don't even know who to go to for anything now. So fortunately, we're, we think, we're, we're past that, but the, the sticking point had been the faculty evaluation process. But as of last year, we figured out the department chair will do the, the faculty primary area of responsibility plus their professional development, and then the campus dean will write the section on the college service and the academic advising. And then they come together and collaborate on a single draft, which they then deliver in person to the faculty member each September when they return the evaluation and talk about goals and strategies and, and where you want to head for the future with the idea that those conversations then allow the faculty member to say, here's what I want to focus my time and attention on, 
and we have the dean and the chair working together with the faculty member to craft that. So that's actually come quite a long way, but that's only been through this forced collaboration. In the end, I think we now have an incredibly collegial system, whereas if you go to other institutions, you see faculty versus administration, and every other Wednesday from 9 to 12, Oh, we actually sit together at one table, faculty, department chairs, and the administrators trying to figure out how to solve problems in academic affairs. Anyone else? Okay, anyone in the audience? Anyone, let's say, in the finance or IT or human resources area? Cavill? Hi, I'm Kevin Anderson, Director for uh, Faculty and Staff Development. My question is to Cindy. Cindy, uh, I must say congratulations to the relationship between the deans and program chairs. I can really see something has changed there. They are even starting to uh, utilize some of the professional services and leadership development programs too. But there's still a little bit of a problem where faculty and I'm speaking under correction, just want to make it clear to the administration that we are not like the administration. We are definitely totally different. So how can we get to bridging or fostering community between that notion that faculty feels that they're totally different from uh, your administrators' staff? So that's actually a good question, and I look at it as a, a another plus. So faculty are not like administration. That's a good thing. Who wants an educational institution with just a bunch of administrators? So what, what's the point of coming to classes then? So what we have are faculty who are engaging and just riveting in a classroom. In fact, I actually spend part of my time each, each semester sitting in on classes I ask permission first, if it's okay, if I can sit in on your class. Uh, just, just for the sheer fun of it, because uh, they're doing some amazing things and they're taking these complicated principles and applying them. I won't give you example after example. So I would say we, we want to encourage and appreciate and support the faculty in the classroom, and that is the job of administration. So it's not a matter of bridging, it's figuring out how can we work together to really support excellence in teaching and learning. It's actually to go back to Jen Billman's question of how do we encourage experimentation in the classroom? How do we get them to try out the cool new toys? I shouldn't call them that, should I? Um, oh, that's cool. <laughs> that, uh, that Bob's team in academic technologies is bringing on board for us. How do we get them to see? And if it doesn't work, it's okay. We'll try something else. But it could get to new ways for engaging students. As we know, students are coming into our classes, uh, the younger ones, where they're attached to these devices that connect them to the whole world that's in your pocket. And so how do we take advantage of that in the classroom? How do we use those tools instead of as a way of disengaging from this incredibly important content that I'm trying to deliver and get that, that to be a tool for engaging in the content? So. I think we support the faculty. That is our relationship. Anyone else? Yes. Um, Please introduce yourself. Oh, hi, um, my name is Pat Taren Hoffman. I'm from Gettysburg Campus Academy of Affairs. So as we are seeing a growing number of all live students, how can we create connections and build a community environment for our online students. Do you want this one, Stephen, or should I start? How about you start now? Finish. Okay. <laughs> so that's actually a really good question. I don't know that we have the answers for that, but I know we've been working on ways of trying to bridge the gap with our online students. One of the things is by beginning to gather more and more data on who are our online students, and we've learned that a surprising number of them are actually taking classes on a physical campus and taking online. And so that is helpful to know. Some of those students are actually participating in on-campus activities. So how do we address the purely online students, and how do we engage them? 
And part of that is through constructing an educational environment. Again, I, you'll probably get tired of hearing this, but I focus on what happens in the classroom or in the actual courses that we're teaching. That is our primary means of engaging in students. And our online classes, I'm proud to say, are focusing on their instructor-created content. That is a signature piece of our virtual learning. And that's where we attempt to engage each individual student in those online classes in the learning outcomes for those courses. But on top of that, we've recently implemented some student affairs staff that are dedicated to engaging in co-curricular and curricular acti extracurricular activities with the students. And that's why we have a virtual learning student at VLSAC. I'm trying to think of Virtual Learning Student Activities wow. Council. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and so they get together and they figure out what do they need and, and they tell us. So that's actually the best of all possible worlds when the virtual learning students will tell us how can we be more supportive and provide opportunities for engagement there in and out of these online classes. Thank you, Cindy. And, and I'll, I'll share also, I think, you know, one of the things that um, we're realizing with the growth that we're seeing in virtual learning is that uh, we have to find ways as we, yes, continue to serve the population that we know is regional. You know, we know that folks from our Levin County service area are participating in our online offerings. You know, we're looking to expand and move beyond that to outside of our borders. And to do that, that means we're going to have to be able to service students that can't get to our campuses. And so as we talk about how do we uh, foster community for them, you know, what ways can we, uh, you know, create access, improve access for our virtual learning populations so that uh, they can start and finish their experience entirely online? Uh, you know, we would not be and will not be early adopters to that concept, meaning there are lots of institutions all over the place that are doing virtual learning, and they figured out ways to make sure that a student doesn't have to come in to fill out a drop slip uh, you know, at a physical campus somewhere or get signatures from several different uh, administrators or faculty persons to move a process. They, you know, we have to find ways to make those things possible electronically. And so even as Bob and he and I have talked often about what technological solutions can we uh, provide to make those things possible. So as we talk about e-forms and the ability to workflow documents electronically so that they can route to the proper people to make the experience more seamless. You know, those are the kinds of things that we need to do. That will foster community because, again, it's going to give them the ability to work through a process um, without having to physically come on our campuses. Uh, at the same time, I think making sure that our virtual students understand that they do have full access and rights to the services available to them on our campuses. And so if you're a virtual learning student, yes, you get to come and swim in the pool just like our students that are taking classes here. You have access to those things. So I think you know, leveraging uh, the VLSA and, and working with uh, Brandi Scaff and her team, uh, certainly Maureen, as she's coming on board uh, to, to help lead the, the unit, um, to, to make sure that our students are aware of what's available to them. And here's the added bonus. If we figure out how to make processes uh, more seamless and virtual for our virtual learning populations, that's going to make processes more seamless for our campus students as well. That's a win-win. Mm -hmm. How about our virtual students? Do you agree with that? Okay. So, so if I could piggyback off of that as well. Um, when you talk about the technologies that we, we have to try to support that, that sense of community for virtual students, one of the, the systems that we rolled out was the Zoom system, which is a video desktop video conferencing system. Uh, we had no idea when we rolled it out exactly how much of an impact on the institution it would have. It certainly would facilitate those virtual students in having a face-to-face -face conversation with our instructors. That's what we had envisioned. All that it's been used for since then has been um, overwhelmingly successful, 
but again, eye-opening in that student to student communication started occurring and faculty started to adopt it for uh, video lecture capture and, and redistribution of those, those lectures. That's one technology that I think has helped to support that sense of community for virtual learners. Again, we talked about the electronic forms and the ability to be able to fill out all your forms without having to come to campus and get them routed through. That's yet another one. Uh, an, another one that you may, may or may not be aware of is we're looking at how we can use uh, virtualization technology to support the lab environment. So in some cases there are labs that, that are dedicated to running these special software packages and for a virtual student that can be extremely challenging. We're looking at technologies to virtualize that package it and deliver it through the internet connection so that a virtual student in their home can run that package on a tablet, a desktop computer, a laptop. It's really device agnostic. So we're, we're continuously looking at the technologies that will help foster that. And Bob, could you maybe tell the group about our award? Yes, yes. So excitingly enough, I can now officially talk about our award. Uh, we, for the fourth year in a row, um, were ranked in the top 10 amongst digital community colleges through a nationwide um, survey. So I was very excited. Uh, we, we got a sixth place ranking in the top 10 uh, and we were, thank you. Most, most importantly, we were the highest ranked Pennsylvania Community College mm -hmm. and there were others in that. Okay, let's move on to the fifth question. What resources were made available to help employees in your department foster community and collaboration? So what resources were made available? And if needed, what resources need to be created? resources in HR that are available to employees or managers, uh, what, what would you mention? Well, it might not be quite a resource, but um, I, I will talk a little bit about creating community through a tool. Who has a Fitbit? Do you all want to stand up and take a couple steps? Because I know you're tired of sitting. When I went to the last session, they were like, we're walking, we're walking. So yeah, it, it is a resource. You know, you, you rely on that now. You, you check your steps. And wow, what a success. I mean, I have been talking to people. And they are excited about this. And hasn't that Fitbit challenge created a sense of community? You now know people within your group. You're all, you're all competing together. Wellness ambassadors have a role. They know one another. So that Fitbit challenge um, has really created a sense of community and, and healthy, all pun intended, competition. Um, but you needed that resource to do it. And so the college, and, and Tim Swavely is here, and I'll, I'll shout, give a shout out to Sandra Croft and Lisa Arnold um, and Jen Stutzman, who were really integral in developing that challenge from the wellness committee. You had to have a resource to do that. And so we used wellness credits from Capital Blue Cross. We asked for some money from the foundation, and, and hopefully all that will, will be granted to us. But, but we were able to find those resources to give you a resource, that, that little Fitbit that you're wearing around your wrist now. And wow, look at the outcome. People have lost weight. They have built a sense of camaraderie within their groups. Their families are involved. So, so it's just amazing that that small piece of technology really a minimal amount of money has created that much of, of a community in the, in the college. And how many times around the globe have we walked? <laughs> seven. I've, is it seven? seven? At least, at least last week, so get out and walk. <laughs> yeah, seven. It's funny, at the gym I go to, there are three college employees and they try to stay on the treadmill until the gym closes. <laughs> so most of the miles, they're really competitive. But it has brought people together, people who normally wouldn't be together. I know I'm on the librarian team, and that's been really exciting. And we're in the top 10. Who would have thought? Well, I'm people are cheating, because they're first and second. So I think they just do a lot of walking. But yes, I think we have a hand up over here on this side. So speaking 
to that end, um, we heard earlier about letting go of old ways of doing things and bettering our processes. So what mechanisms or tools are in place for people kind of on the front lines or just doing things day to day who see improvements that could be made to make us more agile and more flexible um, and better at doing our jobs day to day? What, what resources do we have as employees to give that feedback up the chain? And I will say the first one that I see on a regular basis from all our employees is an anonymous uh, form, a survey that's sent out, and maybe a couple times a week, I will get recommendations on what we can do. What I do is I take those and I distribute those to the appropriate senior level individual who hopefully then engage the rest of the team, especially if it's an idea that could be a benefit to the unit and especially to the college. So I know that that's one way I continue to have people. I just love getting those comments. I think as all of the panelists have said, mm -hmm. there's some great ideas that are coming and some we're able to integrate into it because it's just so wonderful. Uh, some are a little longer term, so that takes a little bit more planning. But again, I continue to encourage you. Mm -hmm. I look at Jim. Jim, sorry to use you as an example, but Jim runs our bookstore at our Lancaster campus. Would you just wave your hand, please? Thank you. Jim gave the idea to me about making sure on our web pages that we are able to have a translator, Google Translator. So Jim, thanks to you, what happened in short order because of the Office of College Advancement and others, we were able to put that together. So thank you for that recommendation. So that's one way. Yeah. Panelists, what other can, ways? Can I also say, I mentioned earlier about having a voice, and one way that you can have a voice is to be involved in shared governance and to serve on a joint committee, serve on a search committee, uh, get involved in an ad hoc committee. Those are great ways to have your ideas bubble forward um, and have someone take action. And so the constituency presidents are here, other leaders are here, and, and we, the, the cabinet, have a very, very, very good relationship with the leaders of the constituencies. So we trust them to bring things forward, but you also have a voice in the, the tool that Dr. Ski mentioned, um, and again, on just serving in shared governance, serving on joint committees, all of those are available for you to, to bring those ideas forward. In addition, the IT team, we have a uh, newsletter. It's called the OIST newsletter. It's a online website. The link is in uh, my hack. Within that um, newsletter, there is a place for you to pr um, produce comments for us for feedback. We have sent out things through our newsletter asking for uh, early adopters of some of the technologies. We have received re um, good responses, but that is definitely a resource that you could use. You know, we, we're able to do some examples. Is there something that you feel we need to create so that we can provide that resource that maybe isn't there right now? Um, tools, uh, things that I'm thinking of is improvement at, so a specific email. Um, so we're trying to find the, the survey. I've never seen that survey. So um, just as a relatively new employee, um, you know, being able to, um, I'm a process oriented person. So when I see little things, just knowing who I might feed that to. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Um, just something from a virtual stu student's perspective, it would be great if Zoom was also incorporated so that way there could be online office hours where professors can interact face to face with students because right now the, you can email them which is great but a lot of students prefer to do one on one more um, personal sessions where they can get a better idea of how, you know, of, of what they need to do with their homework, how to study better, things like that, that would be easily finished within a, say, five to ten minute Zoom session rather than a day or two of emailing back and forth. Thank you. There's a, there's a like Let's hear it from Melanie. <laughs> you know, when you see all those great videos as we did on the day of giving, you see any of the great videos and photographs,
That's our videographer. Man, would you like to introduce yourself so that people sure. can hear that you're a great and proud PAC alumna? <laughs> yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mena. I am a proud hack alumni. <laughs> And i actually currently still taking classes at HACC as a guest yeah. student. And I am in the uh, work group com committee uh, for the symposium. Um, my question is uh, going back to the virtual. So how do you determine um, the amount of um, contacts delivered on online for virtual students? Um, because some professors are still giving a lot of content to students without uh, and we were not getting enough um, lessened. So um, I know that HACK has all the available technology, but I believe that we still have a lot of work in terms of how to use it properly because there are still some uh, professor who just throw it all out there and thinking, oh, it's online, I could just uh, uh, throw the content as much as um, I want and it should be done um, because that's also frustrating for students um, you know that getting the they're not getting the knowledge because it's so much because there is still a deadline to that we have to to meet thank you ski I think it's worth mentioning as we maybe put a bow tie around this question about what resources uh, are available for community and collaboration. You know, I think about what we've done in the last roughly year and a half in inclusivity and diversity. The college has made a commitment and we brought on Dr. Warren Anderson. I don't know if I've seen you this he afternoon. He had another appointment. So he is focused on the overall community uh, and it represents all of us here today, no matter what our backgrounds are. And that diversity makes us a stronger institution for many, many reasons. And I think that commitment and that resource is available for all of us, both student and employees, uh, to leverage uh, that overall education and the access to the forums he puts on, the access to the workshops that he puts on, those are resources available to every one of us, whether we think we're in a certain group or not. I think that's a wonderful commitment on the college's part to provide that resource to all of us. Thank you, Tim. Sydney, how about Manna's question regarding you know, building community in the classroom regarding the amount of information that is provided? How might we address that issue? In three hours? <laughs> <laughs> So it depends if you want to come at it from the angle of instructional design. I'm not sure exactly what you were, what you were trying to get at. In other words, there's a so certain... Yeah, is this really that there's a lot of information and you just wish there was a little more structured way to addressing it? Right. Okay. I feel like um, some of the professors maybe did not understand on how to use the technology properly. For instance, um, I believe um, she was suggesting using Zoom. Um, afterwards so that we can get more knowledge or we can have this communication directly to, to the professor online and getting that answer quickly rather than throwing the, the, the dumping all the works in one week and lack of communication it is harder on us yes the, the technology is there we don't have to go anywhere but then we're also stuck in front of the computer 20 to 3 hours per week um, so how do you determine the content uh, for them so that it will help us as a student? So I, I think that's a, that is a difficult question to answer because each instructor has developed his or her own approach to delivering the content that is within the course. So they're required to follow these outcomes and we even have a course form that outlines learning activities and required text and so on. But how they do that is up to the individual instructor. Now, we do provide training for people who are doing online instruction and blended, but even training for face-to-face -face faculty on technology options through our Center for Design and Instruction. However, 
um, making everybody feel comfortable with the technology and making them aware of and able to use all of the technology under all of the circumstances is a process that takes time. And so there are some people that pick it up really fast, some take longer, and, and it's, so it's an evolution of uh, the process of working through this, which coincidentally is the title of our online, online was the title of our online learning academy where we teach people how to teach online. <coughs> we also have professional development through something called SITE. It's an acronym. And is Doreen here? There's Doreen, <laughs> our new associate provost for our virtual learning. <laughs> so, Anna, I would suggest you see Doreen. Is that okay, Doreen? Okay. Any comment to it, Doreen? I completely agree with you. I think part of the conversations I'd like to have with our faculty, again, they're experts in their field. They are very dedicated to creating their own content. But how can we support them to be more engaging with students, provide more experiential learning opportunities? So again, I think it's having those conversations, giving them the tools, as Gracie said as well. How do we foster that engagement with you on a more regular basis um, beyond, again, just you kind of having to absorb all that content information independently. So how do we make it more of a joint educative process and more conversation? So I agree. Thank you. So I just want to comment to that because I think that... Would you mind introducing yourself? Okay. My name is Maria Diaz. I teach Spanish at York. Um, I, was, I don't teach any of the uh, virtual classes because I think a language should be learned face-to-face. Uh, -face. But I do know about the uh, online learning, and sometimes it may be an issue of the particular discipline that you might want to address. It may not be a one-size-fits-all for some students. It's very easy, because I have students in my class that have taken four years of Spanish, so when they come to me, they zoom through the class and others who have never taken Spanish. And for them, it's a very slow starting process. So it may be something like that, where the class that you're taking, there are some students that already have a background that makes them zoom through the material. And you may not have that particular background. And it makes it harder for you to uh, absorb the 20 hours of work. So it, my suggestion is that maybe some of these may be addressed with a particular discipline. Hi, I'm Amanda Clem. I'm the Hack Foundation Operations Coordinator. Um, I did graduate from Hack, and I'm now continuing my degree at another university. Um, and so as a student, I did take a lot of my classes online, and I have to agree that's one thing I really love about the university I'm going to, all the professors are required to use the video conferencing um, software. So they kind of have free freedom to decide how often. Some of them, we have weekly sessions, and then some of them we meet like bi-weekly. But I've... That is one thing that I found very different from attending Hack that I never had a professor do an online, like they would provide videos, but we didn't have that interaction. And now with Zoom, I think it would be great to really kind of hold them accountable to having to use it because we want to make sure that students learn in all different ways and providing that avenue for all of them. So I know that you want to give faculty the ability to determine the structure of their um, courses, but also we want to look at the students and ensuring that they really have the best avenue of learning and that we accommodate all of them. So that was something that I thought was interesting. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So, panelists, as we wrap this section up, are there any final words of wisdom or questions that you would like to ask this august group of colleagues? I want to ask you something. So one of the questions that the president reviewed earlier was one, what one activity can hack students and employees do off campus 
to promote community and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? So I want to address that. Um, my team monitors social media, Facebook mostly, and Twitter, and some LinkedIn. And we see comments that raise from students loving us and what we do to students slamming you professors, other employees, they, some of them put your names out there and they go in on you. And you may not know this, but when they do that, we protect you. We mm -hmm. send those screenshots to the cabinet level supervisor. So if you are getting, if a professor is being slammed on Facebook and students, as you can imagine, don't care. Even though we tell our students to be careful about social media, they will put you on blast, as the young folks say, on social media. And when they do that, we feel it's our responsibility to protect you, and one of the things we do is make your cabinet member supervisors aware of that. And the president defends you on a daily basis. If the students are being incredibly disrespectful, he will reach out to them. He's met with them um, in his office, because even though they have a right to their opinions, they don't have a right to malign you and disparage you in the public arena. So I want you to know that if you didn't know that, your OCA colleagues protect you and your president defends you often. Thank you. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Absolutely. We also have seen a disturbing pattern in a campus vice president notices as well. We have students who are on social media apologizing for being hacked students. They're embarrassed by it, and it hurts us to our heart because we know how phenomenal you are, our programs, the college, and there's no reason for them to feel ashamed about attending, but some of them do. And they have a lot of followers. So it's not just a person who has five followers. These are students who are vocal about their negativity, and they have a boatload of people who are liking and engaging. So what I want you to do is drown them out. Mm -hmm. Every day, we all encounter positivity at all five of our campuses. If you are active on social media, if you can just once a week post something positive about Hack, our students, our faculty, our staff, um, our alumni, our donors, there's so much to draw from. If you can just post something to counter that negativity, that would be so helpful because there's a lot to brag about. We want to, we respect their opinions, but some of it is quite ugly. So if you can, if there's something really fun, and hopefully many of you talked about the day of giving, um, but if there's something that really tucked your heartstrings, Post it. If there's an alumnus who emailed you and said that they're doing amazing things, post it. If you're concerned about privacy, and you should be, you don't have to use names. Um, you can just tell the story and not use names. If a student or alumnus gives you permission, put it out there. But we know how remarkable we are. If you can do that one thing, just maybe once a week or once a month, anything's better than nothing. Drown out the misinformation and the fake news about hack some of which is coming from our own students. So thank you for that, appreciate it, if you can do that. Can I also, um, speaking about that, in the employee realm, we all love Hack. We feel as if Hack uh, has very generous offerings in terms of employment. I think we are all a community when it comes to our students. Dr. Ski talked about this that this morning and that our students are our drive. And yet there are pockets within the employee community where people are unhappy, and I'm not saying that there's not constructive criticism. That's different than people just being unhappy. And so again, to drown out that unhappiness, for those of you that love working at Hack and believe in the mission and yes. feel like this is where you wanna be and feel that you are well compensated and well recognized for the work that you do, I would ask you to stand up and share your testimony for your experience at Hack. I have heard a lot of people say, wow, when I was at this place of employment, I, I never dreamed I would, I would have it so good at Hack. Those are the voices that we need to hear. Not that we don't wanna hear complaints and concerns when they are valid and it's something that, that you can bring a solution to along with you when you bring that concern. But to, to turn the tide from the negativity to the positive yes. things that we have here at the college, that promotes community. That's good yes. for each of us. There's, there's no, no harm in saying good things that are true and are affirming. Yes. <laughs>
Yes. And I have to say, I was using my hands, and my Fitbit just went off. Oh, <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> so everybody else is wearing Fitbit, too. <laughs> um, I have a question for Liney. Liney, do you guys, um, there's a group on Facebook called Hack Students. Do you monitor that one as well? Yes. Okay. Because I, I don't know how I became a member of it, but I think that especially in the student affairs realm, I think more employees need to be part of that. Because a lot of times the questions are, when is tuition due? Yes. Is the college closed on Good Friday? Sometimes, they, seriously, but it is one of the most active groups I've ever seen on Facebook. And there are times I know that myself and some of my colleagues, we do answer, but sometimes it's a question, if it's financial aid, I'm not answering it, because I don't know enough about financial aid. Um, I think it's a great community that we could be providing correct information if it were monitored by enough people. And yeah. when we do the screenshots, we, Stephen, he's special. No matter what the topic, he gets copied because 99.9% .9 of them are related to students. Mm -hmm. And so once we send the screenshot to him, he is Johnny on the spot with making sure someone responds. Um, Students are very grateful, and the president can tell you more than I do. They are grateful when you respond, and when they have been nasty and negative, um, they're apologetic typically. Mm -hmm. It's not a lesson learned for them. But when we see it, absolutely. And each of our Facebook pages, we have one for the college and one for the five campuses. There are colleagues throughout the college who are trained to monitor and respond to them. Were their backup, so if they don't catch it, we usually do catch it. Yeah. So, but thank you so much. We we agree with you. We have the integrated marketing communications team. Ladies, stand up. <laughs> Ladies, stand up. <laughs> they all monitor social media. And they protect you, and they advocate for you, and they have your backs, your fronts, and your sides. Well, that's right. Well, and for what it's worth, you know, a lot of people can get electronic courage mm, yes. when they don't have to say something directly to your face. And that's why I love our president, who is woke, okay, <laughs> because when he responds from him and says, hey, let's get together and meet, it's amazing how quickly some folks backpedal. Okay? <laughs> so, so know that you are protected. Yes. Know that that's from the top all the way on down. And we thank you, Lonnie, and your team, because we know you guys have our backs. And we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I just want to piggyback on. Oh, I'm Christina Kelly. I'm a development officer for alumni relations. So I'm very proud of all the students and the many alumni here gives me a lot of pride to serve you all. So I want to piggyback on something that Liney said um, and Amy about everyone has a voice. And to go back to your question about how do you build a sense of community after you're a student and you go on to bigger and better things. And I would challenge the students and the alumni and you know all the other uh, friends of Hack employees to turn that around and say, how do I build that sense of community? Because we have so many alumni. I was at an event last night with a lot of community leaders. And when I introduced myself and I said I'm from Hack, I looked around the room and I said, I know there's some Hack alumni in here because just being in this area, there's going to be Hack alumni. Um, and no one said anything at that moment, but when I talked to them one-on-one -on -one throughout the night, oh, I'm an alum, I'm an alum, I'm a proud alum, but how do we all come together instead of being proud alumni on our own or a student on our own, um, how do we come together? And so we have um, a lot of things in the works with the Alumni Association. We have our own page on the website. Please check it out. But I really would like to put it on everyone to get involved because that's how we're going to move forward is if everyone steps up and is a proud alumnus together or a hack employee together. Um, I think that that's sort of the missing piece. So I just encourage all of you to do that. I'll save you some time. Michael Cordino, Dean of Academic Affairs at our Lancaster campus. I just want, when we talk about community at, at the college, events like this, I, I'm, I often think about the fact how lucky I am in a sense that I'm not a frontline person at a campus. I have the freedom to come here today and, and I think about the people in a sense I've left behind at the campus who aren't able to come, who aren't able to get a swag bag, 
And uh, I, I know this is, idea has been floated before about maybe using convocation and actually closing the institution, it, you know, not closing institution to you know, that we all have a day off, but actually have a day where we can get all of, in this case, staff uh, and faculty together and not feel, you know, at least some of us, guilty about the fact that, boy, there's a number of other people, and not to put people on the spot, but it's how many CEO from outside of Harrisburg or Central are here today? And, you know, and some of that's, well, we still have to manage business. So, and sometimes, not to be negative, I'm going to sound negative, but is that something that, that people still feel at, at the campus level that, oh, that's, oh, that's nice, Mike, you got to go and, and spend the day doing that while, you know, we're still working. Um, so, you know, so sometimes those are those, I may say that's a subtle thing where, again, I just float the idea. I know it's painful to find a day where we could actually suspend business operations physically, but really try to focus, um, on, on community for all, and I know that that's where the idea of the convocation, you know, having that college-wide convocation again, and maybe even taking that bold step of saying, okay, we're going to make this as available to all, and I know there's, okay, what do we do about third shift people in the, and somebody still in public safety always gets left behind because somebody has to still monitor the campuses, but I mean, it may be an idea and how practical it is, I don't know, but Michael, thanks for recommending that because in the last year or so, we're hearing more and more from employees who are saying, can't we take a day? Can't we get together? I think for the 180 that were here today, how wonderful it was to meet new colleagues and to celebrate with old colleagues. And you can see the benefit of that to the others that aren't here, you know? So it is something that's being seriously considered to find a location where everybody can be present and all of that. So it is something that's being discussed. So thank you for bringing that up and reminding us. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, before we move into the closing part of this, do you see why now I am just so humbled by the phenomenalness of these individuals? And they did. All of each and every one of you, from where you sit, you lead. And we are so proud to serve with you. But I have to tell you, I interact with these individuals and the campus leaders very, very often. And I will say from the four higher ed institutions that I've worked at, this is truly the finest, the smartest, the most entrepreneurial cabinet and senior leaders that I've ever had good fortune to work with. And so I want to say from my perspective, and it may be a little jaded, is I think the college is in very good hands, and I think the future will be addressed well by all of us, including these individuals who provide some really good international, national, regional, and state perspectives on moving us forward. So thank you, panelists, for being here today. What I'd like to do is move into closing now, because we know it's getting close to time. And what I'd like to do is ask any of you, Michael, I think it was a good comment that you started us off with on maybe coming together at a location to be able to celebrate all the good that is hack. What about from the rest of you today? I see many of the presenters in the audience. Uh, Miles Miller is in the back there. I know you were, your uh, name was brought up before you arrived. But for you, or Lashana and Sarah Jacobson and others as presenters, do you have anything that you'd like to say from your perspective of how you felt the day was and the engagement that you had with your colleagues. Let's start with you as facilitators, any and all facilitators. I think we're going to go with Lashana looks eager. Lashana down here in the front. Yes? Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lashana Stokes. I'm Interim Dean of Enrollment Management here. And I had the wonderful opportunity today to facilitate with Dr. Sarah Jacobson. I know some of you were in the session today, and it really was an amazing experience for both of us working together as a team. I've known Sarah for quite some time, 
but to begin to continue the conversation, as Tim just mentioned, that Dr. Warren Anderson has been doing across the campuses all year long. And I really appreciate the fact that he helped to lay the groundwork for the courageous conversation, the engaging conversation, the open and safe environment that was shared today was so very enlightening for me as a presenter, um, and I know for Sarah as well. So I shared with the group this morning, consider this our topic on micro, the intersection between microaggression and privilege to be part one. And we're looking at part two, three, and four to come. And Lashana, from what I've heard from people at lunch, they would, those who didn't participate would love to hear both of you. So we may try and make this part of a, a road show on each of the campuses. Sounds great, I'm game. <laughs> Before, uh, before you leave your microphone, Lashana, yes. uh, is there anything you recommend? You know, we go to these, these are great. You know, tonight when you're at home, you're going to be talking about, in some ways, what a transformative experience it was. You met new people. How do we keep this going? What do we need to do to keep moving forward with fostering community within our educational environment? That's what we're kind of looking What are the takeaways? that you would recommend we, we have? And I'd love to hear from others too. What are the takeaways? That well, I think that's a, that's a great question. When I was um, teaching faculty, one of the things that I would share with my students often is that this textbook material means absolutely nothing if you do not apply it to your life. And so today, we have a lot to digest. We're gonna be thinking over the weekend of some of the things that were shared today in all of our sessions. Sarah and I provided some immediate things that they can do to um, gain self-awareness, and I think that that is really the key um, to creating community and going outside of your boundaries, your comfort zone, sometimes getting in an uncomfortable place to be able to make it more inclusive toward what we're really striving for is inclusive excellence. And I think that just one step at a time, not feeling that we need to do all of it all at once, but knowing that all of us can play a part in creating more community here at HAC. Great. Other facilitators from today, anyone like to talk a little about what it was like from your perspective? Miles Miller. Thank you. Uh, Miles Miller, adjunct professor, and, and thank you all for the opportunity. I think uh, overall great event and uh, glad to be a part of that uh, to play off of what was just said. Today you probably heard a lot of great ideas, a lot of great thoughts. We heard it from our panelists. You've heard it from the different sessions as well. The challenge becomes what now? What becomes what next? And so for all of us as, as Dr. Ski has said, we need to digest this, and others have said that. Now we need to focus on priorities, and, and that is where the challenge begins. So this is, I, I always see these events as a way to begin the conversation, and we have done that today. It's been done formally, informally, but now we need to take it to the next steps. A lot of great ideas and suggestions have been made, both uh, within the sessions, both from the panels, uh, and what have you. Now we need to say, okay, what are those one, two, or three things that we want to focus on? And who's going to do that? And how do we accomplish that? And what does it look like when we get there? And that is where we, we need to go from here. So I, I always enjoy when we have these. I, I was talking to a lot of people. That's why I was late, Dr. Ski. I apologize. I made note um, of that. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure you did. I'll, I'll have to write uh, some sort of reason for that later, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I was talking to many people after my session, and one of the things that I, I was saying to one person in particular was, we need to do this more often. Um, and, and I know that from a feasibility and logistics standpoint is challenging, but once a year, quite honestly, may not be enough. We need to not only get together and talk about what we've accomplished and the great things that HACK is doing, but also where we're going and what we've done since we met last. And so if we can continue to foster that, whether it's twice a year or what have you, uh, I think that's an opportunity as well for us to look at. And I'll wrap
wrap up with that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Miles. And I know that Cavill and her team will be putting a survey out, and one of the questions will that will be on there is, what are the two or three things you feel we should be doing now? So it'll be very concrete. So that is one of the questions that'll be on that survey. Yes, and there's the committee working on it, and then all of us will take ownership in one way or another. Others, other non-facilitators, what was today like for you? Was it good? Was it, was it great? What about outstanding? So, any final words? Thank you, Steve. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. And to all the committee again. The committee that's here, I see Patty, I think, in the back, and Cavill, and some of the others. Manna, would you please stand so we could recognize you, please? All those on the board. So with that, there is one last exercise I would like to ask you to do, if you're willing. For those of you that are able, if you'd kind of scooch up a little on your chair. Just scooch up a little on, on your chair. Stay seated. And what I'd like you to do is, on the count of three, I would like you to just enthusiastically rise to your feet and say, hallelujah. <laughs> and then once we're done with that, I'll tell you what we just did. So for those that are able and willing, on the count of three, one, two, Three. So tonight, when family and friends ask what you did, you can say that you were at a great all-day symposium. They had us on the edge of our seats singing hallelujah. Have a great weekend.